How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Well, it's Thursday here on this program. You know what that means. Last night was AEW Dynamite. Another very good show, coming off an awesome show the week prior. And they are building towards Quake at the Lake, which is coming up next Wednesday with John Moxley, Chris Jericho for the Interim World Championship. They got to get going building for this all out show because that show is only about four weeks away. So, a lot of stuff happened on the show, a lot of interesting things. So, we'll do the AW Dynamite report here today. We've also got some notes on Vince McMahon. Becky Lynch spoke to ESPN recently about the changes in leadership and what she thinks about all this. I got a few things to say about that. We got, uh, as noted, NXT numbers, which were very good. And uh, a large part of that was exactly the same as Raw. They had limited commercial interruptions, which does always help. Although that was not the only thing, because Raw had a commercial-free first hour, but they still had a very good second and third hour. So there appears to be at least a minor uptick in interest, probably from people that have heard about the departure of Vince McMahon. Maybe they were watching the show, and they've decided, you know what, I may sample this show again. So we'll tell you about those numbers. Lex Luger talks about potentially being inducted into the Hall of Fame and what he would do to uh, receive that honor, what it would mean to him. So we'll talk about that and so much more. If you want to text us here today, what are your thoughts? 425-780-7566 is the phone number. That is 425-780-7566. Brian at WrestlingObserver.com is the email. And you can follow me on Twitter. Always great stuff on my Twitter at Brian Alvarez. And I'm pretty sure Mike has a Twitter as well, which I believe is at Sempervivi. But check it out, everybody, and we'll be back after the break. Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Well, we got a lot to get into here today. I want to mention, by the way, that uh, All Out is coming up over Labor Day weekend. And if you're going, if you are going... Well, I recommend going to f4wonline.com slash Chicago, because we got a lot of information about various things up there, including the Q&A that Dave and I will be doing, which is uh, September 3rd, 10 a.m., Hyatt Regency, Schaumburg. And then September 4th, we actually have a bus, a bus to All Out and Back, which will be taking place uh, Sunday, leaving from the Hyatt Regency, Schaumburg as well. So if you want to jump on the bus and not deal with the traffic, which is the main reason I'm not going to WrestleMania anymore, well, that bus, you better get up there quickly. F4WOnline.com slash Chicago and see what we've got available. Why go all the way there and then not have some fun with us? You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Oh, where's Mike? There he is. I had you muted. I didn't even notice. Isn't that funny? Hey. We've got a lot to get into here today. Right? Right, Mike? Uh-huh. You over there now? Okay. Hey, are you aware that the Ass Boys flew off the stage in a dumpster? I suppose I should start with that, huh? So, uh, they're fine. They had a uh, heavily padded dumpster. And uh, I, I, I don't know exactly what this means, but, I mean, there's only one thing it seems like it means. They actually practiced this in the afternoon so i think they actually got in the dumpster and went off the stage multiple times to make sure that it was all right which is you know i thought and i i talked about this last night on observer radio they had a shot when uh before the match began of one of the dumpsters in kind of a darkened area and there was a production guy kind of lurking around the back of it and they quickly cut away and i was like what was that and so my presumption was that they that they had a, a door in it so they would throw them in the dumpster, like, oh, the old coffin matches when the Undertaker would go in the coffin and they'd have the uh, false bottom so he could get under the ring and then they'd burn the coffin up or whatever. So then they had, like, a, a false door or something like that to get him out of there, and then they would dump the thing off the stage. No. They just heavily padded the inside, dumped it off the stage, and uh, both guys were fine. But uh, I don't want to be that guy, but I'd recommend a, a false door next time. Let's just play it safe, Right. I'd also recommend locking down the top because that thing flying open, I, I don't know. That was 
go with the trap tour. <laughs> yeah, at this point in the game, you know, we, uh, you know, n- it was, it's not like it's, I guess, the worst thing in the world with how well that thing was padded, but I don't know. You, you can go with the trap door. And there, there, was, there was padding, by the way, because the, the chat here thinks it was all peanuts. It, there was actually thick, you know, thick padding inside yeah. all f- the walls of the dumpster. So it wasn't just, you know, those, those uh, foam peanuts. No, and look, they, really you know, mean. obviously Jericho falling off the top of the cage and all that sort of stuff. I know people have made fun of the fact that the way that it was filmed, you saw how safe that it was, quote unquote. I know he said he got hurt, he hurt his elbow or whatever it was, but obviously they're going to gimmick the thing up. And I'm sure they did the best they could with this. It's just that top went flying open as it went over and it's like... I don't know. Just you take those chances and, you know, they the way everything is set up in wrestling, it takes forever to almost do everything anyway. So to do some camera tricks and to get them out of there somehow, some way, get them out under the stage, you know, yeah, probably should be the best bet. So you don't have a stupid tragedy on national TV. Somebody loses an arm because it gets crushed underneath because they go flying out as the thing gets tipped over. Spurs says everybody complains about everything no matter what. Actually, no, we don't. Unless you don't listen no. to the show. There's a lot yeah. that I talk. In fact, I get yelled at because I'm too positive about NXT 2.0. Which brings us to the rating for the show on Tuesday. 649,000 viewers, up almost 10% from last week. Best viewership since June 7. NXT's fourth highest viewership of the year to date. 0. 0.15 and 18 to 49, up 15% from the week prior. It is the third highest, 18 to 49, of 2021. Up in most demos. Although it did not uh, do all that well with females 12 to 34. Isn't it funny whenever they have like some big women's thing on the show? These women just don't want to watch other women. The the four-way tag for the vacant NXT women's tag team titles. And the, and the female 12 to 34 viewership was a .04. What was Mediterranean on? Now, it did do well with age uh, 35 to 49. Serious. Older women. Older they women love like that it. below deck show. They love not, it. Not the, uh, not the younger women. But anyway, as noted in the opening segment, there's a few reasons for this. One of them is that uh, there is a, a somewhat of an increased interest in WWE since Vince was out of there. People are sampling the show to see if it's improved. Although, as noted, it's improved a little, but it's going to be a while before you see big improvements. And, uh, and also, a commercial free. The the Raw show had no commercials in the first hour, which led to a monster first hour. But they did maintain that for the second two hours. And then NXT had, I, I'd have to go back, but I think the first half hour had no commercials. And then the first half hour of the second hour might have had no commercials. But they definitely had limited commercials for two of the half hours. And then, you know, they loaded up on commercials for some other stuff. But uh, good numbers for, you know, it's good numbers for this week. Raw. SmackDown, NXT, AEW the last two weeks has averaged just under a million. We'll see what it does last night. So uh, the only one that's really dying a death is Rampage. Everything else is doing uh, very well for its time slot. We had Becky Lynch talking about the end of the Vince McMahon era. It is the dawning of a new era, she said. For me, it's crazy and sad because everything I've ever known about WWE has always had Vince in charge. And we wouldn't have WWE the way it is if it wasn't for Vince. He's somebody who believed in me, allowed me to do everything that I have done. We have we have the opportunity to change some things that maybe weren't so great that we didn't love, she continued. I think everybody's very excited and optimistic because we know that the people in charge are some of the greatest minds in the business. Triple H at the helm is phenomenal. What he's done with NXT speaks for itself. And, uh, and she goes on and on. You know, do you remember... Uh, when I would review Raw every week and the show was just an atrocity and I would bury it and everything that sucked and didn't make sense and didn't air after it had been booked and then was booked and didn't take place and changed minds and ripped up scripts. Remember that period? Yes. And there was all these blokes on Twitter that were stand-up for WWE and they were defending all of it? Yes. Well, you know what? I always wonder why they do that. Because I think they think that... The people in WWE also think it's great like they do. And that by defending it, you know, that those WWE folks will, I don't know, get on their side or whatever, maybe follow. I don't even know what their mindset is. But the fact of the matter is, 
if you think that I'm the only one that thought that it sucked and that the people that actually work there didn't also think that it sucked, I mean, think again. Here's the thing, especially with Becky, okay? Bro, the moment, the moment Vince was gone, Becky's out of the stupid outfits and she's she's not a heel anymore, okay? And when she first turned heel, they kind of got the word out that it was her decision and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, I don't know what was and wasn't her decision, but I do know that on uh, SummerSlam last year, uh, there was a lot of discontent that day. And whether the discontent was the way it was done or how it was done, the fact that it was done at all, I don't know. I just know there was a lot of discontent that afternoon. And, you know, people like Becky, Seth, and you could go, like, up and down the roster. They're not stupid people, okay? Seth can be a stupid person on social media, but in real life, he's not a stupid person, okay? So, you know, these these wrestlers, I mean, I'm sure there's a couple that, you know, actually, I don't even know if there's any that drank the Kool-Aid. Maybe, uh, I don't know, McAfee? I don't know. But in general, don't think that I was unique in thinking that this all sucked. I was not. Well, I mean, <laughs> you say McAfee, but he's a an outside star who, again, it's a different mentality. I think if you grew up with pro wrestling, if you have that mentality, you are trying to look more positively now. Triple H knows who Harley Race is. Harley Race came from the territorial era. There are still things that took place then that they could apply now and make things better. Not everything, but they could. And everybody needs to stop taking the bait on the smoke-filled rooms that the family took the business out of. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Back on the show, Brian Elber is here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. We're in the chat talking about IcoPro. And how ironic that our next story is about Lex Luger, who was a spokesman for IcoPro back in the day. Watch these old retro Raws, and there's Lex Luger pushing that Ico Pro. It was horrible. It's just horrible stuff. Lex Luger says being inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame would be the cherry on top of his career. 64-year-old will be the focus of Sunday's episode of Biography, WWE Legends on A&E. In an interview on Sports Illustrated, released on Thursday, Luger spoke about his health, possible induction to the Hall of Fame. It's mind-boggling. He says, I'm in phenomenal health. Other than my mobility issues for my spinal cord issue, I'm very healthy. And that's a miracle of God after what I put my body through. I usually use a wheelchair or a walker, but I can walk some. I have great mobility. I drive. But you know how your power will go out for a moment during the storm? That can happen to me. And I'm on the floor before I know it. So I take a lot of precautions. I live independently, which wasn't supposed to happen. I don't look the same because I don't hit the weights like I used to, but I'm healthy. Luger was also asked about possibly being inducted to the Hall of Fame. He says, I might pop out of the chair for that. I would take that chance if that moment comes. The honor would be the cherry on top of my career. And as I've talked about a thousand times on the Brian and Vinny show, Lex Luger got a bum rap. I believe that with all my heart. I have watched so many builds to a big Lex Luger payoff where he was great. And then it just gets yanked out from under him every single time, over and over again. And I'm not saying that he would have been like the next Hulk Hogan or the biggest star in wrestling. I don't know. All I do know is is he's got a bum rap for his career because, God, you know, the times he should have but didn't win the WCW title or the time he won that title on Nitro and it got like the biggest pop they'd had on that show in forever and then they immediately took it off of him and then even the build towards that summer slam with yokozuna and then he doesn't win like it's just like one time after another i'm watching it's like here we go again they're going there oh there it goes oh poor lex what can you do you remember the lex can't work and you look at him with like today's eyes like you know he was weak and it's like watch him with Ricky Steamboat like watch him when he turns dirty i mean I, the stuff with Barry Windham his stuff and in late and you know the late years of the NWA before it was sold and when it was sold to to Turner he was he was really good and yeah i guess he had to be motivated and everything but he got such a bad rap when he started about his work and his being aloof and all that and then in hindsight because of the the mangled pushes and the mess the messes that he was working at you know his reputation takes a, a hit and 
they owe him. They still owe him, as far as I'm concerned, because of that confidential piece. You remember that show, Brian, that used to air on the national network on Spike? Of course I do. I don't know if that's available on the network or not. Y'all want to see a nasty, petty, nasty show? That's one. And they actually had an episode where Mean Gene's hosting it, and they play the 911 tape. They had no reason to do a story on Elizabeth and Lex Luger. None. And they did it out of pettiness and spite. And after Elizabeth dies, after all that goes down with Luger, they run that 911 tape of her choking, and it was foul. And I don't know why that movie was never released on him. You know, the the whole, what was it supposed to be? I don't know if it was supposed to be on A&E or on the network, whatever. You know, it's like the Vlad Superfan one. All of a sudden, it just disappeared. Apparently, now they're going to play it, or they're going to play a new version of it on A&E. He deserves to be in that Hall of Fame. It may not mean anything, but to sometimes some of the people, you know, that are in the business, a guy like him probably will mean something, and he certainly deserves whatever payoff he's going to get for that night. You know, I got to mention one other thing, too, because I don't want to run out of time. Nor do I want to be that guy. But you know what? I am that guy. Why, why try to pretend? I told Tom that he needed out Yano Yano. If you heard the show, I talked him into it. You know what he was going to do? He was going to try to wrestle him. I said, don't do that, bro. You've lost two straight. Don't go in there with an Olympic caliber wrestler and try to wrestle him. <laughs> now he's an Olympic caliber well, wrestler. Well, you know, he has been in the past. Well, it's not like Tom's a current UFC fighter, but it's not like I'd say, hey, you can you can take Tom, Semp. He ain't in the UFC now. But anyway, I said, listen, bro, you got out Yano Yano. And he did. He did. So I hope I get a cut. But I got to say one thing about it. Did you guys see this match? I did. I'm very proud of Tom. I'm very happy for him. But I've never been so disgusted in my life. Why? They had the easiest... The easiest finish, and they didn't do it. So what happens is Yano comes out with his DVD, and Tom wants a DVD. Yano doesn't want to give it to him. So Tom says, well, I have got a DVD. And he pulls out Sister Act, which was a big hit for three weeks in Japan in 1993. He goes, let's trade. Yano goes, I don't know about that. So Tom goes, well, I have Sister Act 2 as well. Two disc. Yano's yeah, like, ah, fine. So yeah, they, they, they trade. So now Yano has the Sister Act 1 and 2, and Tom has the Yano DVD. So Tom's so excited, and he goes to the corner, and he opens up the DVD. It's empty. You've never seen Tom look so devastated. And also, by the way, I was wondering, what is up with this guy's hair? And no sooner am I typing him, like, what's up with your hair, bro, that his wig gets pulled off. And he goes, I can't believe anyone believed that wig. <laughs> I totally bought it. I was like, what did he do with his hair? So anyway, they did this whole match. They go back and forth and everything like that. And, you know, there's all the Yano shenanigans and the Tom shenanigans. And finally, you know, there's a referee distraction or whatever. And Yano punts, punts him right in the balls. And Tom just stands there. And so Yano tries to punt him in the balls again. And Tom just stands there and sell it. And, of course, he then, you know, pins Yano. He wins. He gets his first win in the G1. And then he reaches into his shorts, and he pulls out a cup. And, man, the moment, the moment Yano kicked him in the balls, I was like, please, please, I'm begging you. I was waiting for him to reach into his tights and pull out the Sister Act DVDs. Then Yano would open the DVDs and his were empty because they were in Tom's trunks. So when he went to kick him in the balls, he kicked the DVDs and didn't hurt Tom. I was like, could you have an easier finish? But they didn't. They did every ball shot finish you've ever heard. I got to wear a cup. I was so mad. And listen, if I hear one person go, uh, two CDs aren't going to protect your nuts, bro, it's fake, number one. And number two, have you ever, have you ever watched a UFC in your life? Dudes get kicked in the junk all the time, and they're all wearing cups, and they all need five minutes or more. It's not magic. So, bro, if you're going to convince me that a metal cup will make your ding-dong impervious to injury, then I can believe that two DVDs 
over your package. We'll keep everything all right. I couldn't believe it. It like fell into their lap. Literally. Right there. Didn't do it. That should tell you right there that Tom didn't tell me anything. I think that should be... That would be a little bit too uncomfortable. I think what would have no, made, come on. I, I think what it would have made more sense in your scenario, since we have taken this to the levels that we have, uh, maybe you know Tom gets kicked. He does what he does. He he shows off the fact that he's got a a cup on. Not only a cup, folks. Some people just pull out the cup. No, he's actually got the ties and the, the everything. The wraps still around the thing. You know, legit cup. Shoot cup from Tom Lawler. Then he could have just kicked Yano in his balls because maybe if he kicks him hard enough, then come, you know, out shooting out of his ass comes the... Bro, we're on the the radio here. Can you please control yourself? Comes the DVD that, that Yano ripped off from Tom. And Tom wants that DVD, and maybe that's where Yano had it hiding. So he could have done that, and the, the DVD could have came shooting out of his rear end, and he could have gotten Bro, the you're the worst. Pit. I actually came up with a good idea, now you've got some preposterous oh, idea. Oh, it's a, it's a great idea it was a great to idea. be wrestling with three... Oh, he's already got three pairs of denim fake trunks on, or whatever the yeah, hell those are. you absolutely <laughs> could. People are like, you can't hide uh, two DVDs. How can yeah, you he could. hide DVDs in his crotch? Well, there, ever... there's, there's, two, there's two things, Mike. Number you, one... What does he stick his wang one, through the holes you, in the you DVD? You pull your, your trunks up a little higher, and so the DVD is actually on your stomach. That's number one. Or, yes, there is a hole in the DVD. So there's a lot of options here. This could have been done, but they decided to go... The, uh, this is one of the dumbest old things we've way. done on radio, and we still have about a minute and a half of this segment. What well, we the don't have hell to keep going. Here? I got more I can talk about. Jesus Lord! I also saw um, David Finley beat Will Osprey. That was about well, as David good a fifteen-minute match as you could uh, have. But it was only fifteen minutes. It was the main event. That was weird. All his matches have been very, very strong, and we get into this too. Adam Summers and I on the Big Audio Nightmare, the original alternate at the website, the oldest Japanese wrestling-based podcast out there. That and the start of Five Star Grand Prix, which I know, I know you haven't seen any of that, but Filthy Tom is probably going to be beating on you very soon to see some of that stuff because that's been very good too. He ain't gonna be beating on me, kidding me. What are your thoughts on what's going to happen? Why are you wrapped in DVDs? Maybe you know what? Maybe I'll wear a suit of DVDs. Then what's he going to do? <laughs> Nothing. What are your thoughts on what's going to happen at Raw in Cleveland? Will Gargano come back? Well, hey, any, at this point, anything's possible. Three weeks ago, I'd say no chance. Today, anything's possible. And I hear the music, as Dave used to say. So I'll be back in a moment with dynamite. More dynamite. Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. For the Dynamite Report, DJ here says, I still think Tom gets to upset the big man. I think he's talking about Okada. Yeah, but, well. but, listen. Mm. Tom needs to beat Fall A. He has to. Because Tom has faced two big men, and they have both slaughtered him. Okay? So, yeah. Tom still has to face Okada and uh, Jeff Cobb. And Fale. And Fale is next. If Fale beats Tom, no one's going to believe that he can beat Okada. And certainly they're not going to believe he can beat another giant. If he beats a giant, I think people will believe he can beat both Okada and Jeff Cobb. Don't think he will, but they could believe that. I suppose he could also lose to uh, Fale, beat Okada, and then people will believe that he could beat Jeff Cobb because he beat Okada. So these are all... uh, these are all options. But anyway, we got to get into this Dynamite report because i got a lot to talk about. Jay Lethal beat Orange Cassidy. It's a good match. Orange Cassidy, every time he's in there, he delivers. Jay Lethal's awesome. The uh, worked over Orange's leg, the entire match's stem. And uh, finally, at the end, he uh, went for the figure four. It was countered. Orange cradled him, went for the orange punch. Jay hit the lethal injection and pinned him. It's very good. And then Sanjay Sotnam came out. They were going to break Orange's leg. Who should make the save but the best friends in Wardlow? And Wardlow will be defending the TNT title against uh, Jay Lethal at the Battle of the Belt show, which is taped Friday and will air Saturday. 
Adam Cole comes down to the ring. This dude's so over. People are going nuts for him. Adam Cole, baby, the whole nine yards. Gets in the ring with the Young Bucks and Red Dragon. There's five of them. There's a six-man tournament coming up. And he does this big speech about loyalty, loyalty to the Bucks. And he says, you know, we got this uh, trios match coming up. And, uh, you know, Kyle O'Reilly's not cleared. And you guys don't seem to be choosing Bobby Fish as your partner. And so uh, so you just got, you can't be in the tournament. The Bucks are like, what? And he goes, uh, let, me, let me rephrase that. You won't physically be capable of being in the tournament. And Red Dragon turns on the Bucks, and they stomp a mud hole in him. They're beating him down. The place is going nuts. And all of a sudden, they go even more nuts when Hangman's music hits. Hangman hits the ring. He runs wild. The, 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 the uh, heels flee. And he offers his hand to Matt. And Matt shakes his hand. And then Hangman leaves. So it is still up in the air. What does this mean for the six-man belts? What does it mean for Kenny Omega, who is also coming back here very soon? we got twists and turns coming up. We had a great John Moxley promo. He don't care who wins Chris Jericho and Wheeler Yuta. The loser is going to lose, and the winner is going to die next week in the championship match. We had Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter versus Tony Storm and Thunder Rosa. It's a very good match. The crowd went crazy for it. Huge chance for Britt and Thunder Rosa. And Tony Storm killed everybody with the uh, ass attack in the corner. And finally, she goes for it again, but she accidentally hits her own partner. And then uh, Jamie Hayter pins Tony Storm to set up Jamie Hayter versus Thunder Rosa. And they gave Jamie Hayter a lot of babyface style spots. So I think when her and Britt split, she's going to be the babyface here in this deal. And I don't think she's going to win the title, but the the reality is that this battle of the belts, I mean, you need a title change here and there. And I don't think it's impossible because there's a lot of things you can do if, if Thunder loses it to Jamie Hayter and then Britt Baker's upset that Jamie Hayter has the belt. And there's a lot of ways you can go, but this is a very good match. Crowd was hot. We had uh, Sammy Guevara and Tyre getting married. Eddie Kingston wants a match with Sammy at the pay-per-view. Powerhouse Hobbs comes out. Taz announces that Team Taz is no more. Powerhouse has a new entrance. He comes out and he kills this Ren Jones. And then Ricky Starks' music hits and the place goes crazy. And Ricky tears on his down to the ring. He's attacking Hobbs. He also shoves the referee out of the way, but that's just enough for Hobbs to grab him and put him through the ring with a spine buster. And then he just scowls and walks away. I thought this was awesome. And that match is going to be great. Coming up at it all out. We had uh, Miro promo. He's still conflicted. Seems like it's going to take a while to get unconflicted. Darby Allen promo about the coffin match next week with Brody King. Christian beat Matt Hardy. Somebody had a sign that said something like, I, I played this in No Mercy 99 or something. These guys have been around a while. And they worked very hard. It was fine. And finally, Matt goes for an elbow drop through a table. Christian moves. Matt crashes through the table. Christian tosses him in the ring. Kill switch pins him. And then after the match, Luchasaurus' music hits, and he comes down. He distracts Christian. Jungle Boy hits the ring. Christian runs for his life. we got to do four more weeks of this before the pay-per-view, so you'll be seeing a lot of that. Daniel Garcia challenged American Dragon to a rematch. If he can ever come back, he's now the Dragon Slayer. That's probably also an all-out match. Ethan Page in the ring, very upset that he's never on TV, even though he's been on TV regularly, complaining about never being on TV. Out comes Stokely Hathaway. Stokely gives him his business card. It looks like uh, looks like he's joining up with him. So Dan Lambert might be history, at least for the time being. We had 2.0 and Anna Jay doing a promo backstage. He attacked the security guy. Then we had this dumpster match. The acclaimed at the gun club. We talked about the finish. The acclaimed one, they tossed the gun club into the dumpster. They pushed the dumpster off the edge, fell to its doom. You know what I liked about this? Before the match started, there was a brawl. And then Max Caster grabs the mic, and he demands they play his music so he could have accompaniment, which made it much better. And man, he had a line about Vince McMahon's retirement that this place ate up. It was a good rap. It's a good match, fun match. Thankfully, nobody got hurt in that crazy dumpster spot. 
Rampage Friday. We don't need old Fauntleroy because it's live. So no matter how I read this, it's not a spoiler because it's live. John Moxley will face Mance Warner. If Mance Warner beats John Moxley, he gets a shot at the AEW Interim Championship. Maybe I should have had Fauntleroy help with this one. Madison Rain debuts, and Swerve in Our Glory will defend the tag team titles in a street fight against Tony Nese and Josh Woods. Don't yell at me for how I read these matches. They're all live. Next week is Battle of the Belts 3. Claudio versus Takeshita. Thunder Rosa versus Jamie Hayter for the title. And uh, Wardlow and Jay Lethal. All title matches on Battle of the Belts tape Friday. If you want to know what happens, you can uh, you can read the spoilers on the front page. Then Quake by the Lake. Darby on Brody. King Coffin match. Lucha Brothers versus Roosh and Andrade in a tornado tag. Jade Cargill open challenge. That's interesting. And uh, John Moxley versus, as we were about to find out, Chris Jericho, who beat Wheeler Yuta in a really good main event. Wheeler Yuta's great. Jericho did a great job trying to make him look like a guy. I don't think there was actually any spot where people actually believed that Wheeler Yuta could beat Chris Jericho. But the best the best spot was uh, he went for the Judas effect, and Yuta ducked and hit him with his uh, seatbelt, mousetrap, whatever they call that cradle, that he was uh, taught by Chuck Taylor. And uh, that was the closest we got to convincing people that Yuta could win. But then Jericho grabs him and, uh, and switches not to a Walls of Jericho, but to the Lion Tamer. He puts his knee right on this poor guy's head, bends him backwards like a pretzel. This dude taps out. And it was perfect. It was perfect. Because the story is that John Moxley doesn't want the sports entertainer. He doesn't want Chris Jericho. He wants Lionheart. And so Jericho putting on the Lion Tamer and beating his protege with the Lion Tamer via submission. He beat the submission guy via submission with the Lion Tamer. It's it perfect. And then afterwards, uh, uh, Moxie came out, uh, chased him out of the ring, and then Jericho did the promo vowing that Lionheart would return, and he promised to stretch John Moxley and win the title. I like this show a lot. And you know what else I liked, Mike, before you have any comments? You know what I liked? What's that? I liked that I did that whole Dynamite review with a CD in my pants. And you know what? I didn't slice my junk off. It didn't break. It did not prevent me from doing my job. Was that a walk to remember? What are you talking about? What is that DVD you have there? Actually, it's the Star Wars Last Jedi read-along. It's Paisley's. You know what I think of this? What's that? I can read. Anyway, what are your thoughts on this show? <laughs> well, a couple of things. Um, I don't think Daniel Garcia ever needed Chris Jericho to get out this side of his personality. I don't think he ever needed to be part of that group. I and mean, we'll see how it goes with him as part of that group. I mean, it's okay, but... I don't think he was needed, but I think Anna J for sure. I think she needs Chris Jericho and it's, I know it's been two weeks now. A lot of people didn't like her promo. I actually liked it, you know, a couple of weeks ago where she's talking about choking people out. That seems like it's going to be part of her thing. Her coming out of her shell, I think is needed with the Jericho appreciation society, especially having, <laughs> Matt Menard's head and, and whatever you know, whatever they call Angelo Parker, Cool Hand Luke or whatever, him over there. I actually like that a lot. Stokely Hathaway going on a recruiting mission here. We've seen some wackiness with Jade and, and everything that goes with that. But him becoming a legitimate manager, bringing in Lee Moriarty, bringing in Ethan Page, maybe bringing in Scorpio Sky. You know, those three guys fit together perfectly if you look at you know, what they are. So that could be a direction they could go. Bottom line is I like Stokely a lot. Miro and Malachi Black, that yin and yang with the, the heaven and hell thing and, and, you know, forces working together, I like it a lot. You know, uh, Miro, for a guy who doesn't wrestle much on TV and is just basically vignettes with him being conflicted and talking, I mean, he's great. He is great doing that. Any 
him the way he came into AEW with how they pulled the 180 and made him what everybody wanted him to be, and he's got something that he can sink his teeth to, into. I love it. And so the stuff going on with Malachi, I like a lot. Powerhouse Hobbs and Ricky Starks are great. I, I talked about Ricky Starks on the solo show I did a couple weeks ago. He's a star no matter how you cut it. He'll be a star. If he wasn't wrestling, he's great. And Powerhouse Hobbs is the future, one of the pieces of, the, of that company's future. Jamie Hayter I think is great, and I think – her taking the title off of Thunder Rosa, you can do a lot more with that with Britt Baker and you know how they've gone at each other. And it probably is a good thing to keep Britt Baker tethered to Jamie Hayter because she was, I don't want to say the best thing in that match, but she was really the standout piece for me. So that's uh, that's a dynamite. Hey, have I reviewed NXT 2.0 yet? Try to get going on that. Oh, we did it yesterday. Man. You want to talk about ratings? Luchasaurus has yet to touch Christian since his turn. Do you think him and Christian are in cahoots and Luchasaurus will for real turn on Jungle Boy at the pay-per-view? Dude, I came up with that idea last week. I don't know if that's what they're going to do, but they spent they spent well over a year building it. I find it hard to believe it's going to be blown off in four weeks and we move on to something else. I think that they could very easily... Because, you know, Luchasaurus was never conflicted when he went with, with Christian. So I could easily see Jungle Boy getting screwed by Luchasaurus. Then you go with Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus at the next pay-per-view. And then you built up to the second match with Christian that Jungle Boy ultimately wins. And you got you got six, eight months out of this feud. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if that's the direction they went. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also WrestlingObserver.com. You know how you do Cameo? F4W I Online. That. F4W yeah. Online. I bring it up because you know today I, is. I, hold on, I did a cameo a few days ago, and the person that requested the cameo had been in the crowd at SummerSlam '92, and for some reason, I was like, it was like a celebrity had wanted a cameo. It's like, wow, you were at that show, but I bring it up because, <laughs> as uh, as shocking as that was, and I wanted to plug my cameo at 4 w Online. Uh, Earl here on my on my Twitter. Earl. Earl. On my on my Twitter, uh, is it called a timeline? Yes. Right here. Interesting thing, life. I was at both events where they pushed the dumpster off the stage. Wow. That's how you responded in the tweet. Yeah. Wow. Wow. They were there for the first New Age Outlaws match with the dumpster match with Chainsaw Charlie and and uh, and Foley, and they were there for the second one that just took place yesterday. That's actually pretty amazing. And you know that happened at a time where WWE would you know accidentally oops show boobies and today is national boob day so what no, better it's not. day yes yes do the hashtag i dare you go ahead it's true <laughs> what better me? day alexa ain't gonna tell you that one don't turn on anyway what better day to get a cameo from brian alvarez than national boob i'm gonna day? plug that right now hey alexa do you want a cameo from brian alvarez for national boob day You should. She just said she didn't know. She didn't know If that. she knew, the answer would be yes. But you know what? It's also national. We're out of time day. So I'm going to wrap it up. I recommend you all get a, get a cameo. They're a lot of fun. And they're cheap. $35. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow to talk... Uh, I don't even know what. It's Friday. It'll be one of those shows. So don't miss it, everybody. And that's it. Thanks, Mike, as always. Callers and listeners over the studio, even you Twitch homies. I'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.